Thank you. It's wonderful to be back in Korea and to see all of the growth and energy in the Korea blockchain community. Uh, we're really happy to be here and to be working with you. Uh, I would like to talk about the growth and the future of roll-up technology. And I'll tell this story in three parts, past, present, and future. So uh, let me start with the past. My own engagement with this area started, I think as many people did, with a moment of recognizing the potential of this technology, recognizing what it is that we could do and what it is we could build by taking advantage of the opportunities unlocked by, not only by blockchain, but by scalable blockchain. And for me, one of the crucial moments in that was this uh, conference that we hosted at Princeton University in early 2014, where we brought together a lot of the people from what was then a very small community of blockchain builders. And um, in, the, in the time leading up to this and in the time during this conference, I had, a, I had an aha moment that really changed uh, what I was going to do over the now nine years since then. And that was a realization that uh, uh, that smart contract technology in particular was going to do something that I had seen happen in a really big way twice before. So the first one was something that I saw happen when I was younger, and that was the arrival of personal computers. Personal computers put into the hands of so many more people the opportunity to build software, to build new kinds of applications, um, and deliver them to people like themselves. So no longer would uh, computation be something that only a few lucky people could do, or only a few lucky people could use, but suddenly we're going to have this tremendous growth in opportunity and tremendous growth in accessibility of the technology that followed from the fact that highly advanced uh, technologies like this existed. And this, of course, turned out to be incredibly important. The same thing happened again, and this time I uh, was fortunate to be able to participate in this next revolution, and this was the, uh, the moment uh, when the web became programmable. What I have here is the hot Java browser. This uh, debuted in 1995, um, and it was not a product that lasted a long time, but it really opened the eyes of a lot of people about what was possible on the net. Because what this did was it took the web and moved it from something which had been a way of delivering static content to people and turned it into a platform that you could use to build applications. And again, a very large number of people were now able to build these applications and distribute them, and a much larger number of people were able to use them. And the result of this was an explosion of creativity. And when we use the internet today, what we are using is essentially the technology that was pioneered here. So this opened up a tremendous uh, field for innovation, for building, for creativity, and opened it up to a very large number of people. So with those in mind, when the idea of smart contracts crossed my consciousness back in uh, 2014, I said, aha, this is going to be the same story again. This is going to be a way to, uh, to take what was previously a way of doing a relatively limited set of activities, namely moving money around, and it was going to create a new kind of platform that would allow us to deliver new kinds of services and to open that platform to so many more people. To build, in short, a globally shared, transparent, and trustless virtual computer. Something that had never been possible before. We could uh, interact with each other across the internet over distance, um, and that was wonderful, um, but uh, this was different because this was, a this was globally shared, and because it was transparent and trustless, we didn't need to worry about whose computer or whose server was running this, uh, this technology, because we could see it, and we knew that it was going to execute correctly. So this was a huge change in the opportunity to build technologies. And it seemed to me, at least then, that this was going to be a giant opportunity to unlock creativity, and to uh, unlock uh, new kinds of, uh, of applications. But not long after this realization came another realization in the form of a question, will it scale? 
because the obvious ways of building that global, uh, globally shared, trustless, transparent computer don't scale very well. They involve taking all of the activities that are happening on a chain, all of the smart contract activity, and executing all of that smart contract activity on every single user's computer. Um, and if we're, going, if we're going to have everyone's business happening on everyone's computers, in addition to the privacy considerations, there are some real issues with scale. And so this became my quest, uh, starting in early 2014, to understand how could we scale this smart contract technology, because we were going to need to be able to do that in order to make real the, the, the possibility of this globally shared, transparent, trustless computer. So how are we going to do that? And that led, um, before long, to the creation of the first uh, version of a layer two, or roll-up, which was Arbitrum. Um, in the fall of 2014, a group of Princeton University students that I was supervising did a course project in which they built the very first uh, sort of proto version of Arbitrum. You can go on YouTube and search for something like uh, Princeton Arbitrum student presentation, and you'll probably see this, and here you have the students um, uh, here you have the students in a screenshot from this video explaining what are some of the core concepts of, it, of uh, Arbitrum. In particular, the idea of what's now called interactive fraud proofs um, you see up in this board. So uh, already we were starting to build, we were starting to experiment. We were a long distance from having a, pro a product, of course, and I'll be honest, this was a student project and so not everything worked perfectly. Uh, the students did impressive work during a short time. But this, this, again, was another step in helping to show what's possible. Now, as this work developed, there were a couple of key ideas in it, um, which I want to talk about. The first key idea is the idea of layer two. That is, in building a blockchain, it's very helpful if we can build on top of some larger, more stable chain. Um, you can then have a solid foundation on which to build the security of your chain. And with that foundation, you can build things that would not be possible if you were building a layer one. That foundation that, in the case of, of Arbitrum technologies that's provided by Ethereum, is critical. So we are not an alternative to layer ones. We are a complement to it, and layer one is very important for us. But this key idea to build on the security of a larger chain. And then the second key idea is, uh, although we want to rely on that, um, on that uh, parent chain, uh, we don't want to rely on it for everything. We want as much as possible to move the activity of this layer two chain off of the main layer one chain, move everything, almost everything off chain, and just use that parent chain, that layer one, to record what's happening um, and to prove it so that people can trust, based on the, the uh, secure activity of that layer one chain, that the layer two chain is going to give the correct results. So these are the core ideas uh, behind layer two. Now, um, uh, after this student project, I went off and did some other things for a while. When I came back to Princeton, um, I met up with a couple of then PhD students, uh, Harry Kolodner and Stephen Goldfeder, um, and we worked together to build a more serious academic prototype of Arbitrum. And that led to this paper, uh, which was published in the Usenix Security Symposium in the summer of 2018, about fi almost exactly five years ago. Um, and this gave a more complete design for Arbitrum for a layer two uh, based on uh, interactive fraud proofs and then uh, described an academic prototype we had built, which was a proof of concept that showed what was possible but was not really anything close to a product. Well, from there, it, uh, soon after that, we founded the, uh, the company. Here we are all looking younger uh, uh, without five years of, um, of startup stress under our belts. Um, but nonetheless, the, th the three of us, um, then professor and then PhD students, uh, now co-founders, um, started, uh, started to build this seriously. Um, and what we, d what we aimed to do uh, at the time, perhaps naively as first-time startup founders, was simply to take our academic prototype and make it compatible with Ethereum and then roll it out as a product. Well, we had to do a bunch more to reach product market fit. We had to solve a lot of engineering problems. I'll spare you that, all of those stories. Um, 
But while we were building all of this, over the three years it took to go from founding this to actually having a mainnet product, something else very important happened, and that is credit to Vitalik. Vitalik posted in 2020 this very influential post um, about the roll-up centric roadmap for Ethereum. And the idea there is simply that, um, uh, that one of the keys to scaling up the Ethereum experience and the Ethereum ecosystem was to uh, make Ethereum the best possible place to host roll-ups, to, uh, to build Ethereum into that solid security foundation that would provide what, would, what was needed for roll-ups to grow, and then to rely on roll-ups to a great extent to be the solution for scaling Ethereum. We were happy to see this, and we were happy to work with, uh, with uh, Vitalik and with members of other Layer 2 teams to try to figure out how to make this possible. And that brings us up to the present. Now, um, the promise that Layer 2s would be able to provide better scale and better performance um, than you can get on a Layer 1, I think has been realized. And to choose my favorite uh, Layer 2, Arbitrum 1, um, and compare it against using Ethereum alone, you see that Arbitrum 1 has roughly 20x lower cost per transaction, about 5x higher gas capacity at present, and about 48x faster block time, a quarter of a second versus 12 seconds. Now, this is not to dunk on Ethereum because none of what we did would be possible. None of what we're doing today would be possible without Ethereum. Ethereum plays a very important role. So this is not so much L2 versus Ethereum, but L2 with Ethereum versus Ethereum alone. And so we've demonstrated, and other teams have demonstrated too, that it's possible to get much better performance, higher throughput, much lower cost for people. And that translates into new types of applications being possible. All right, so I'm not going to go through, through this in detail. L2 architecture has evolved quite a bit. I just want to point out two things about this. First, um, that the, uh, the functionality of a modern L2 basically breaks into two halves. You could draw a line uh, down the middle. If you cut this down the middle, everything to the left is what you might call sequencing, and everything to the right is execution. And indeed, one way to think about the way a modern roll-up works is to imagine it almost as two chains, that you have a sequencing function which is intake of transactions that produces on the upper right here a sequence of transactions, which is kind of like a chain. So you can imagine this chain, sequencing chain, which only just notarizes that some transactions have arrived. And then on the right side and down on the lower right, you have the L2 blocks that are produced by execution by consuming the transactions from that chain one at a time and executing them. Now, importantly, both of those parts are anchored in Ethereum down here on the lower left. And this is the security anchor. And this is what makes a rollup a rollup. Because it's anchored in Ethereum. And that means two things, that we rely on Ethereum to post data so people have, avail people have guaranteed availability to know what is happening on the chain and we rely on Ethereum for fraud or validity proofs. And which one you use depends on which kind of rollup you use, but any modern rollup provides at least data posting and fraud or validity proofs. Now, uh, the L2 ecosystem has grown quite a bit. This is a graph of total value, uh, summed up, total value on chain summed up over all of the uh, major layer twos, and you see over the last year, this uh, roughly doubles from around $5 billion to around $10 billion. But perhaps even more important, this is a graph of transaction volume. The blue line is transactions per second on Ethereum over the last year, and the red line is the total transaction volume of all the L2s. And what you see is the L2s starting about even uh, with Ethereum and growing to be about 5x Ethereum in terms of total transaction flow. And by the way, because L2s have cheaper gas, Typically, those transactions each consume more gas than an average Ethereum transaction. So it's 5x in transaction count, but it's a larger even increase than that in the amount of computational activity happening on these chains. Okay, let's pivot to talk about the future. Uh, the future, of course, is the most interesting place, um, that it, and it's about where we're trying to get to. All right, so let's remember this goal of a globally shared, transparent, trustless virtual computer. So how are we doing in delivering that? Well, the first thing that we need to do in order to deliver that is 
to not lose focus on the things that we've been successful at so far. The successful L2 teams focus every day on driving cost down in order to lower user fees and bring more people and activity in, and focus every day on driving scale up. And much of the important work that is done in this, um, uh, in this area is the everyday grind of improving a little bit every day. That continual improvement and that hard engineering work is really important. It's not all about major breakthroughs. Um, a lot of it is about continuing to just work and work and work to drive these metrics. Um, and that's important that we don't lose, lose sight of that. But of course, we need to strive for more. Um, moving forward incrementally is valuable, but we also want to look for those breakthroughs or look for those quantum improvements that, uh, where they're available. Okay, so the question that everyone is asking, and of course, which also shows up in the titles of quite a few talks today, is this question of how can we onboard the next billion users? What do we need to do? And of course, the answer can only be that we need to remove all the barriers to that happening. If you believe, as I do, that this technology is naturally valuable and naturally attractive, that it brings a lot of value for the reasons that I talked about earlier, um, the question is, what are the barriers to the next billion users coming? And what can we as a community do to eliminate those barriers? The first thing, of course, is user experience. People complain about the user experience of essentially all blockchain systems and their right to complain. We are not where we should be on user experience. We're not close to where we should be on user experience. Uh, we need to do a lot better. But we also need to recognize um, that the reasons why our user experience is not as good as it could be are not only the shallow reasons, such as the fact that we like to build systems for people like us, and people like us are not normal uh, in many ways, um, but also there are deep reasons. There are deep reasons because the technology is built in a way that is convenient for building, but is not always, um, but is not always well designed for users. Um, we need to take an approach that involves a bit more user-oriented design. And this is the idea that the, uh, the key to the best user interface is not just about surface, it's not just about what it looks like or how it's a, and how graphical elements are arranged. The best user experience is driven by thinking very hard and very creatively and pragmatically about what mental models users should have about how a system is supposed to work and what users will expect to happen and how we can build those expectations and then fulfill them. And this means that we need user experience considerations to permeate our entire design. It's not enough to just put a surface over a, uh, over a system that is designed for, for nerds. It's really important that we think deeply about what users need us to deliver, how can we make a model, an approach that will work for users, and then how can we build that. And we need to do that also recognizing that users are not all alike. Uh, and users uh, in different roles, in different stages of life, in different cultures and parts of the world have different needs, and we need to also understand. This is one of the reasons why it's so important to have such broad participation in this community. Okay, but one of the questions uh, we also need to ask if we're going to get to a billion users is how can we onboard the next million developers? Because if we're going to have a billion users, we need two things. First of all, we're going to need a lot of developers because a billion users require a lot of tools, a lot of products, a lot of support. And it's going to take a lot of people to actually build and sustain that. But also, we need brilliant ideas. And the more developers we have, the more access we will have to smart people, to people who have different points of view. And so building those million developers is crucial to developing the breakthroughs of the future in addition to the routine work of the future. So how do we onboard the next million developers? Well, where are the developers today? Um, uh, and here I have a maybe not so happy story to tell, at least if you're a member of the Ethereum community. Um, because uh, here's a graph uh, that shows the number of developers who use different programming languages um, and tool chains to build their uh, to build their software. On the left, we have Solidity, which is the main language that's used for building Ethereum applications, the on-chain part, with about 20,000 developers. Uh, in the middle is Rust, uh, the up-and-coming systems programming language in the broader world, with about 3 million 
That is about, about 150 times as many as solidity. And on the right, we have the, uh, the elder of, um, of uh, programming languages C++ with around uh, 12 million developers. And so how are we going to get over that gap between a, a community of 20,000, maybe a few more developers, and getting up to the million or beyond? Right now, we sort of have a house divided in the blockchain world. You kind of have two options. You can be in the Ethereum world over on the left, where you have the Ethereum virtual machine, or EVM, which is the main execution engine. And if you're developing software, you're developing in languages like Solidity or Viper, which are, which are good, but let's face it, still a bit experimental. Or over on the right, you can have certain other blockchains, uh, like Solana or Near, uh, where you're using different virtual machines as the core execution engines, things like Berkeley Packet Filter or WebAssembly. And then you can program in the more popular programming languages, Rust, C, C++, and others. So you can be on the most popular chain with the largest um, uh, and most robust community, in, in my opinion, Ethereum. Or you can be in an environment where the development tools are the best and most welcoming to the largest number of developers. Well, so the obvious solution to this, if, if we could figure out how to do it, is to give you the best of both. And I'm going to tell you in a minute about how that works. But essentially, the idea is to build a single system that supports both the Ethereum virtual machine and some other uh, more, uh, more modern, battle-tested, and scaled uh, virtual machine, like, say, WebAssembly. And then on the bottom, be able to program in any of the languages, be able to program in the uh, uh, in the Ethereum-specific languages like Solidity and Viper, but also in Rust, C, C++, and others. So built by building a single system that allows you to do both and allows you to build parts of your application in one, parts in the other, and interoperate, then we really open up a, a new world. And this is what Arbitrum Stylus does. We're really excited about Stylus. We announced it last Thursday, opened up a, uh, a test net, which you can try. Um, you can read the developer docs if you're a developer. But essentially, it uh, is a real implementation of what we call EVM+. Plus. This idea that the Ethereum virtual machine and uh, EVM compatibility, EVM equivalence on a layer 2 chain is not a ceiling, it's a floor. Uh, that is, we want to build on top of it not by taking away, not by stopping anything that already works from working, but by adding new capabilities. So EVM Plus is implemented by Arbitrum Stylus. Um, and um, this allows you to run these two closely coupled virtual machines on the same chain. So you can have smart contracts that are written in Solidity or Viper, Rust, C, C++. They can run together. They can fully interoperate, fully compose. It's an amazing piece of engineering. I'm incredibly proud of our team for having built it. Uh, and I really would urge you to try it, because it's one of those tools that if you're a developer, you can't really appreciate until you try it. Anyway, I think this is, an, this is a very important step forward. Um, I hope that the Ethereum community itself considers adopting Stylus in Ethereum, and we'd certainly be happy to work with them uh, if they're considering that. OK, so we have a bunch of ways of scaling up each chain. Oh, and I forgot to mention, uh, while shilling Stylus, it's also 10 to 15x faster than EVM. OK, end of advertisement. Now, um, methods like this and methods like that everyday grinding to get, become more efficient, not to mention Moore's Law helping us every day, allow us to scale up each chain so that we can improve the amount of activity that we can do on a single chain without breaking anything. That's really important. To, um, uh, to scale each chain. Now, um, in addition, though, we need to move to a world of many chains um, because uh, we want to be able to scale to a larger scale and grow the capacity faster than we can grow the capacity of any one chain. So uh, many chains leads to the idea, now quite popular, of app chains. The idea that someone who, in maybe in a previous point in time, maybe last year, two years, three years ago, might have built an application to run on top of an existing chain, now they have the opportunity to launch their own chain. Now, this is not without cost. And um, we need to resist the temptation to try to turn everything into a chain. Because running a chain does involve more complexity and more cost, a little bit more technical risk than if you're building on someone else's chain. But many people will need what an app chain can provide them. 
many people will want to decouple the economics, decouple the governance of their system from, um, from uh, an existing chain. And app chains give them the ability to do that. So uh, you can imagine a world uh, which we, uh, and it's not a coincidence that we, we call our program and the Arbitrum team Orbit to do this, um, but the concept is simply that uh, you will have not only chains revolving around the sun of Ethereum, but you will also have moons revolving around those. But of course, what we really want is something more like this um, that is very large and where we can scale to a larger number of chains. Because scaling requires not only making each chain faster, but also having more chains. Uh, so uh, we really want to increase this, and we're excited, and our team and other Layer 2 teams are working actively on making this possible. Now, uh, one of the key ideas here is the idea of Layer 3. That is, if you can build a Layer 2 on top of la a Layer 1 like Ethereum, building a Layer 3 provides, on top of a Layer 2 such as Arbitrum 1, provides additional advantages. Now, you might be asking, why would I want a Layer 3? Why don't I just build a Layer 2 myself? There actually is some really important advantages to Layer 3s that I think will drive more and more teams to want to build Layer 3s. Why build a Layer 3? Well, Layer 3 has lower cost than a Layer 2. Why is that? Well, the largest, it, the largest part of cost of operating a, an, I'll call an upper layer chain, is, uh, is the gas in your parent chain that you use. So if you're building a Layer 2, you're using Ethereum gas. If you're building a Layer 3, you're using Layer 2 gas, which is maybe 300 times cheaper. Um, and so by reducing what is the largest source of cost in operating a, an upper layer chain, uh, you can do that by being a Layer 3 instead of a Layer 2. Uh, second, a Layer 3 chain can have faster finality than a Layer 2. Why is that? Because layer, it's because Layer 2 chains are better, uh, are engineered to provide faster finality than Layer 1. And also because by building a layer three, you are in, in a very real sense pooling your resource, not only with the, all of the organic traffic on the layer two you're building on, but also with all the other layer threes that are there. So lower cost, faster finality. And then also the ability to evolve your protocol faster because layer twos are becoming more capable than Ethereum, not only in performance, but also in programmability and flexibility. Ethereum moves more slowly. It's a little bit uh, more careful. And that's rightly so. Ethereum has more of a history. It has to support uh, more, a broader range of overall activities, most of it through layer twos and eventually layer threes. So it's, it's right that Ethereum moves more slowly. But the advantage then, of course, of being a layer three is you can use protocols that are built on top of this more innovative, faster, and more flexible layer two technology, and that pays off for you. So layer threes, I think, are an important uh, step forward. Okay, so we see a future of many chains um, uh, with continual growth of chains from layer two to layer three, maybe someday layer fours for those who want it. Uh, that's really important. Some of those chains will want to be tightly coupled. Tightly coupled simply means that a set of chains decide that they are going to, um, a set of chains decide that they're going to get together they are going to share some resources. The operators of these chains are going to validate the other chains. They're going to uh, create a shared security environment across these chains. And what they get in exchange is much faster and tighter interoperation, composability between those chains. So some will choose to do this. This is not without trade-offs, though, because when you tightly couple to someone, you are agreeing to expend resources to support them just as they do the same for you and you're taking on a shared security responsibility. So this is not, uh, o this is not meant to be open to everyone willy-nilly, but it will be very valuable for those who decide to ally themselves in this way. So what emerges from this is a vision of a set of self-governing voluntary consortium chains, where groups of chains will get together, they'll ally themselves, and they will decide to work together, share security, and share resources in order to get faster composability and, uh, and, and tighter uh, security coupling. Now, I believe strongly that we're not going to see a world with a single mega chain that, uh, with limited uh, membership and centralized governance. I think we're going to see a world instead of many voluntary self-governing consortium chains. Uh, so we're trying to build this uh, future of a globally shared, transparent, trustless virtual computer. Will it scale? Yes. 
It will scale. We have demonstrated that it will. We're not done. We're not close to done, but uh, we need to keep working on this goal. There, there are exciting times ahead. We're going to be able to build amazing things together, and um, I look forward to working with uh, the Korean blockchain community and many others all around the world as we build this future. Let's build that future together. Thank you very much. Kansamnida. Thank you.